With every passing week, the stakes are just getting higher and higher and the room for error, the margin of error is getting smaller as the match days roll on. Man City and Arsenal and Liverpool all eliminated from European football in this midweek and we roll into the weekend here with everything still to play for in the league. Man City won't be playing their away in an FA Cup game against Chelsea but for Arsenal and Liverpool there is no time like the present to go and put pressure on City. Get ahead of them. They will have a, a you know a game in hand, Man City. But put that pressure on. Get ahead and you know if one of them was to slip up this weekend surely that would be their elimination from the title race. The first game we're really going to be focused on for this weekend is Wolves at home to Arsenal. Now Wolves for me have been one of the stories of the season. Like a couple of other clubs we've been featuring on the channel, they have had one of the terrible seasons for bad luck. Their bad luck has really circled around early season VAR refereeing decisions as well as injuries and a non-entity of a transfer window in January and in the summer with Gary O'Neill coming in right at the last minute. And you know, really everything they're achieving this season is a, a resounding success for me. And at home, they fear absolutely nobody. When you look at this team here, it is Gary O'Neill Wolves front to back, so there's not really any compromises needing to be made. Cunha is back in the building. Lamina and Gomez continue to write the headlines this season, and summer signing Santi Bueno probably comes in to retain his starting place. Against an Arsenal team that are looking to shape up, with Thomas Partey coming back into midfield over Jorginho, maybe that gives them you know that extra dimension that they maybe need against a Wolves team that will be very physical, very active in the centre of the pitch and will not give Arsenal a minute to breathe. It looks like Tommy Asu might be favoured in the left-back spot here for his defensive prowess because the likes of Sarabia, Cunha, even Tommy Doyle, Gomez, Lamina, all the guys we spoke about, they can go and cause Arsenal an absolute world of trouble. Now, we do see Semedo and Nate Nuri is very uh, bombastic attacking wingbacks, but the, the you know the ability and the tactical uh, acumen uh, is probably the right way of putting it. Of Ryan Nate Nuri has been a real wild card. It's been a real wild card for uh, Wolves because throughout the game he can easily come up and join in the attack as a third attacker, uh, especially during that kind of press. So having someone extra in there that can, you know, make sure that Gomez and Lamina have got a tougher job of you know winning the ball, turning it over, and trying to play it into space for the likes of Semedo. And Nate Nuri out wide, I think, is probably a smart move by Mikel Arteta. This back three is very comfortable in, you know, defending in 1v1 situations. But we do often see one of these three kind of step into that defensive midfield spot. Traditionally, it has been Kilman, but if he is going to be sitting in this role here for Dawson, I can imagine that being maybe Santi Bueno or Totti a little bit more. But with Havertz maybe dropping into this zone here to play... It's all going to be about the runs that Jesus can get as well as Saka whenever Arsenal are in attack and they're going to be trying to play the ball through Odegaard and Rice. Because although I expect the majority of the match, Wolves will be camped in their box and probably defending for their lives for large parts of it. Because of the speed, the pace and like, you know, all the, the whole team is really singing on the same hymn sheet here in terms of tactics and positioning and whatever. I'm not too sure from open play as it were with all the possession Arsenal are going to get, how many shots, how many actual goal scoring chances they're going to get early on in this match. Wolves are a team that can definitely frustrate. We've seen that against all the top teams in the league that they've been playing this season. So going 2v1 against Saka, 2v1 against Jesus and crowding out eh, Havertz and maybe even the midfield here depending on where Odegaard finds himself. The difference in this match is going to come down to the goals scored because... Saliba and Gabriel Magalhaes have been the most formidable centre-back partnership in the league for me, no two ways about it. And, you know, this back four of, of Ben White and Tommy Asu can be a very rigid four where if Cunha, Sarabia, whoever else might join into attack, if Wales are only going to get two or three opportunities in this match, they really need to take every single one of them because this Arsenal team, as much as Wales can camp in with five at the back, double up into two banks make it really tight and congested. It is persistence versus resistance. And generally in football, resistance is going to win over if you've got the quality and, you know, the energy in the team. And I think there's a, going to be a big bounce back feel from Arsenal having getting eliminated from the Champions League. So I don't actually think it's going to be an overly high scoring affair. I do fa I do fancy Wolves to get a goal or two. It really depends what type of Arsenal shows up having just travelled to the Allianz Arena and also been eliminated from the Champions League. I think with Wolves at home in the season they've had, etc., I would take them to score two in this one normally. But with that Saliba, Gabriel Magalhaes effect, like I really do think that they are really formidable. And I don't want to sell them too short. So I'm going to go with Wolves to score one goal in this game. 
And I think Arsenal have definitely got the victory in their hands in this one. It is just going to be a matter of them showing their mettle, their fortitude. Can they get it over the line or not? And I think it could be a case of if it did go 2-1 Arsenal, Wales might need to then throw some more bodies forward. They will have to make subs through the game and lose some quality. And ultimately, that might come back to bite them in the bum. I'm going to go for... I'm going to go for 2-1 Arsenal. I'm tempted to go 3, but I'm going to stick with 2-1. And like I mentioned at the tip off of the video, there is absolutely no room for error at the top of the table here. But also at the bottom as well, with all the points, deductions and everything else that's going on, Luton Town are in with a real chance of maybe saving themselves here. And they're playing Brentford this weekend, who really have not lived up to pre-season expectations for one reason or another. I just don't think they've really got enough... Uh, you know, X factor in their team as it were to really make a difference in the league when you see the improvement of the likes of Wolves and you know, one or you know, Aston Villa been an unexpected uh, runaway success and you know, other teams of that kind of nature as well. And Luton Town at home, full strength lineup is ready for them. We know their style of play, they really play into you know, you know, the players they've got play to their own qualities and their own strengths and also use the pitch to their own advantage. Brentford, but I do think, will fancy themselves in this game because. You know, Luton really don't, on paper, have the ability to definitely say they'll be outscoring Brentford in this game. And when Brentford have got Ivan Tony and Mbwemo back, maybe it's still Wisa, but any combination of these three guys is a really formidable front line that should be causing Luton a lot of problems here. And with Pinnock back in the building, Collins and Ayer uh, as well in front of Flecken, I think Brentford have got maybe a little bit too much in defence on this one. But Luton at home, you know they're absolutely going to go for it. I think they, they scored a goal in this one. There's no getting around that for me. But I think Brentford ultimately are going to probably get a victory that maybe looks to give them a bit of a, you know, a reason to try and fight to get further into that mid-table if they can catch up with the likes of Crystal Palace, Bournemouth, Fulham, these sorts of teams. So I'm going to go for Brentford 3, Luton 1. And if Burnley are going to have any chance of keeping up with Luton and maybe even just climbing over them right at the very last minute, they have got a massive six-pointer on their hands this weekend away to Sheffield United, who, you know, became a bit of a meme mid-season and have kind of went quiet over the last couple of weeks. Relatively full strength team for them this weekend. We see Vinny Souza, Ben Berrett and Diaz, Ollie McBurney, January signing Garbage is in as well. So pretty full strength team for them. And Vincent Company's Burnley are, you know, they're not they're, they're not giving up on themselves. They're not going to change their style of play for anyone. And, you know, this is a decent enough team you've got, I think, across that front six position. The goalkeeper is still a coin toss, it looks like, which is madness considering how good Murich has been uh, from all the things I'm hearing. Certainly, I think he did have a blunder for a, a goal here or there, but overall been saving a lot of shots and apparently looking a bit more impressive than Trafford so I'm, I'm surprised to see that's a 50-50 split this week. But Charlie Taylor, Asignon, Brownhill, really good outlets here in the wide areas and then the likes of Foster, Fafana, these guys should have some opportunities against this Sheffield defence. I don't think Burnley keep a clean sheet in this one, in fact I could see Sheffield United getting two goals in this match just because being at home, they've not really got anything to play for so it's real pressure off for them and if they want a pressure off game at home against somebody in the league, Burnley is the only team that you can think of would be the, their ideal opponent in that regard. But let's say Burnley are kicking and screaming and fighting and are trying to play football you know, the right way, as it were. And I think with the way this game is going to go, I can see Burnley hitting the back of the net a few times and I'm going to take them to win this one by three goals to two. What a week it's been for Aston Villa. Tottenham dropped points last weekend to give them a bit more control over fourth position and then they've eliminated Lille in the Europa Conference League. And they come out this week to play a Bournemouth team that are you know, getting a lot of plaudits and having a lot of nice things said about them. And maybe next year, Bournemouth can have maybe a little bit more of a breakout season. But Unai Emery's Aston Villa have went week to midweek to weekend to weekend all season long. And although they have had probably the most understated injury crisis in the division so far, they have not been making excuses and they've just continued to get the job done. Bournemouth, but themselves, you know, sitting down here in 13th on 42 points, they're definitely looking to get themselves into the top half of the table so they can call their season a success and have something tangible to show for it. Last time Aston Villa played Bournemouth was actually after playing a Europa Conference League group stage match, and that game ended up finishing two each. And I think that match, that kind of situation, might inform Unai Emery for how he's going to be lining up for this one. We're going to see the typical chess ball from Aston Villa here, the 4-4-2, with the flexible players in the wide areas like Bailey and Rodgers. Diaby up in attack as well for a bit of license to roam. No Dougie Louise, no Buba Camera. So we're seeing a midfield of John McGinniessa, and Yuri Tielemans and quite a strong back four there. 
But let's say Bournemouth are going to fancy their chances. They've got uh, Semenyo back in last week. He was out. And guys like Solanke, Christy, Cliver, Kerke is back in for this one as well. We'll definitely be looking at Aston Villa as a team that if they can perform well against, it does show, you know, the progression that they've made individually and collectively across this season. Because Aston Villa being fourth is kind of, you know, Aston Villa are kind of like the English Leverkusen this season. Maybe beating Arsenal, Liverpool and City to the title is just it's kind of unimaginable, really, in the Premier League kind of situation as we find it now. And I think even just them being in the title race for a minute or two back in December is maybe as close to an equivalent as we can get outside of the whole Leicester thing, of course. So uh, I definitely think they're going from strength to strength. They've got a lot of feel-good factor in them. And this game should really suit them pretty damn well because with McGinn and Tielemans in here in the, the centre midfield zone, you've got a really good matchup for Christie and Cook in terms of the styles and, you know, both the strengths and weaknesses across across both teams' uh, engine room there, as it were. So I think that's going to be to Aston Villa's benefit because as long as McGinn and Telemans can play this midfield game, the rest of this Aston Villa team is very well built to progress the ball through the pitch and make goal-scoring opportunities for one another, covering into spaces, running into spaces, interlink can play, and Ollie Watkins is just absolutely on fire at the moment. So although Aston Villa are, like, I don't know if I'd say weakened, but definitely not get their first strength team out for this one. No no two ways about it. I actually think the firepower here is just going to be the difference. And Aston Villa have been scoring goals for fun all season. It's been one of the things that has separated them from the pack, is that they can score two, three, four goals in a game, and it's not really a surprise anymore. And that happened quite early season. Thielmans and McGinn have been absolutely fantastic this season, and I think like they'll quite relish coming into the engine room in a game like this where they will have to, you know, hustle and bustle, win their duels, play the ball smartly and, you know, get uh, Aston Villa progressing up the pitch. And with Diaby, Rogers, Bailey, all these guys are in a little bit of a rotation pattern. It's been kind of limited because of how much, you know, injury suspensions and whatever else in between is limited to Unai Emery's ability to pick and choose for individual matches, etc. So I think all of them are in a constant state of having to prove their worth. And Watkins is one of the main beneficiaries to it because the energy, the endeavour and the supply he gets around him from his teammates is a huge part of the reason he's able to score some goals. But Neto's a decent keeper. Sinise and Zabarnia are very capable centre-backs, it must be said. And having Kerkez back out here is definitely, who's becoming a bit of a fan's favourite, I think everyone loves a bit of Kerkez these days. You know, at Bournemouth have definitely got weapons himself. With the pace of Semenyo, Clivert who can run into pockets as well as Otara. If Aston Villa are going to be getting up the pitch here, they will be leaving spaces in that, you know, oh, big DC there got really big, didn't they? <laughs> Make that one a wee bit bigger just for giggles anyway. But him versus Solanke and then, you know, the recovering defence, sweeper-keeper Martinez, you know Bournemouth are going to get chances. They're going to get shots on goal here. I don't think a clean sheet is likely just with... Like I say, the energy and the endeavour that uh, Andoni Iraola has been getting out of Bournemouth so far this season. I think this is going to be a great one to watch, a, a great one for the neutral, an end-to-end -end encounter that's definitely going to have goals in it. It is really a case of how many goals Aston Villa are going to get from where I'm sitting. I do think 2-3-4 is really on the menu for Aston Villa on most occasions. The feel-good factor around Villa Park, having to knock out Leo and get, you know, going even further in Europe cement or close to cement in that top four place i think the place will be absolutely rocking and if a goal can go in early enough a villa can get the four i don't think bournemouth throw the towel in i think they keep in this match for as much as they possibly can and i think ultimately they've got a goal or two in them as well so i'm going to go for aston villa to win this one by four goals to two on the face of it ever nottingham forest isn't the most exciting premier league fixture but if you've been keeping up with the broadsheets and you've been seeing all the financial stuff that's been going on the points deductions for both teams present appealed and maybe in the pipeline still this is a game of who knows how many points it's going to be worth really when it's all said and done the only thing both both teams know is they are in a relegation fight where they like it or not. Can we call this a six point? <laughs> I'm not too sure. Uh, but a very strong Everton team is projected to play this one. Ben Godfrey coming back in at right back, perhaps. Uh, Dakuri, Onana, Andre Gomez back in town as well. It's been a while since I've seen his face. You know, it's a really strong midfield. Dwight McNeil, Ashley Long, Wide, and Calvert Lewin is, you know, a, a capable Premier League striker. Uh, Nottingham Forest, Gio Reyna has been. Uh, getting into the Premier League. Let's see how well he does. With Morgan Gibbs-White and Callum hudson Doy in support, like, you know, Forrest have definitely got weapons that can definitely hurt you. And Chris Wood has been living his absolute best life recently. But it's really the defence. Omo Bamadeli, I was a big fan of breaking through at Norwich, but he's not quite cut the mustard yet at Premier League level. And you can kind of say the rest for most of these guys as well. 
Nico Williams has had some good moments. Matt Sells was good in France, but he's like the fifth keeper they've signed. I don't think there's going to be a lot splitting the two teams, to be quite honest with you. I do think Nottingham Forest have more goals in them, and I think Everton will probably recognise that and be a little bit more cautious, a little bit safer, and try and pick their moments in attack, which being at home probably doesn't inspire much confidence. But I say Gibbs White, Hudson Adoy, Reina, there's real danger, real creative, there's a real creative spark in that team that Everton are nowhere near having for my money. Onana's good, Dakuri's good, but they're more like endeavour, energy, box to box, you know, will and desire. Whereas, you know, these guys have some of that as well, don't get me wrong, but it's just a bit more high level quality Forrest have at their disposal here. Everton scoring this one, no two ways about it for me, but I do think, like, I'm a big Morgan Gibbs White fan. I'd like to see Gio Reyna do well as well. And I'd like to think that Forrest are probably going to get two goals in this one. I'm going to go with a Desmond 2 2. I'm going to make this a two each draw because I just, yeah, I don't think Everton at home in this game will be beaten. I don't think Forrest are, yeah, 2-2. Two -two. Maybe it's a little bit too little too late for Oli Glasner and Crystal Palace to really, maybe similar to Bournemouth like we were mentioning, get into the top half of the table and finish their season off with some sort of achievement, some sort of high. But having beaten Liverpool last week and their performances, the results have been steadily, you know, improving over the season. And you can definitely see what we were talking about on the channel when Oli Glasner was appointed at how this will change Crystal Palace and make them a real wild card for the remainder of the season. West Ham have just been eliminated by everyone's favourite team right now, Bayer Leicester Cousin. Eh. But West Ham, hot on the heels of Man United, who do have a game in hand. They're still going to be thinking about qualifying for European football next season, although David Moyes might not be around to actually enjoy it for himself. He'll definitely want to finish his West Ham career with some sort of legacy, so that maybe in hindsight, or maybe in retrospect, the West Ham fans might actually appreciate him a little bit better. I think I would call this a full-strength Crystal Palace team. Having Eze and Olisi in those attacking roles that are quite free in Oli Glasner's system with Mateta who seems to have found his best form under Glasner is a real threat. Adam Wharton's been getting tons of praise recently Munoz as we've seen the January signing is an absolute whip on the right wing so plenty of uh, weapons here for Crystal Palace and again similar to what I was saying about uh, Sheffield United there's not really any pressure on Crystal Palace there's you know they're not really doing anything in the table it is all about you know them really refining the strategy the tactics and getting all the players on side so the manager can shop a bit wiser in the summer the same is not true for West Ham a lot more pressure on them the backroom staff and the players on the pitch of course and this looks like a really strong team as well Emerson I don't think he played midweek but Suchek Alvarez and Ward Prowse is a really good midfield three with Pac Keta, having not played against Leverkusen, fresh, fit and firing for this one. Jared Bowen still trying to get himself to the Euros, along with Mohamed Kudus, who has been one of the revelations of the season. I actually think this one's got a, a case for being the sneaky outsider for high-scoring game of the weekend. I could see Crystal Palace getting three goals in this game. I think they've got a goal from the bench and probably one or two from the tactics and the formations and everything we've seen pre-game. And West Ham are definitely, like, Kudus, Paquette, you know, like, they're definitely scoring some goals in this one as well. I don't think uh, Crystal Palace will be able to resist so much of the West Ham attack because Crystal Palace will attack, will leave spaces. You know, they're quite unapologetic in that sense. And I think uh, West Ham and David Moyes will be well set to have a really good match against them here. I don't know if I'd quite take a draw because I do feel that Palace are going to win this one. And yeah, I'm going to go, I'm going to swing for the fences on this one. I'm going to say Crystal Palace are going to win four goals to three. And on Sunday, Liverpool will know exactly where they sit. Let's see how Arsenal and Wolves get on Saturday. If there's points dropped there for Arsenal, then you've got to think Liverpool will be coming into this game absolutely turbocharged. But if Arsenal win, keep the pressure on. It will just be stick to business and let's get the job done. Fulham, again, they're in this kind of middle pack, going nowhere kind of fast. Looking for the top 10, of course, because with 49 goals scored this season, they are, they've scored more goals than Man United. They're one of the most attacking teams in the league. And although they've not got the highest quality in all the attacking positions, the players that they've had this season have been getting stuck in amongst it. Like a Doug Eaton beetroot. Willian, Iwobi and Andy P are all back together in support of Rodrigo Muniz, who has been, you know, the kind of the striker that Fulham have been needing all season, or really since they lost Mitrovic. With Raul Jimenez not really hitting the ground running. And the back four has got a lot of energy, a lot of quality, and is a lot of fun. I'm a big fan of Anthony Robinson and Timothy Castagna. And Adebayo is getting linked to the good and the great around European football at the moment. And this feels like a game that Jao Palfinha could be eating up lots of interceptions, winning lots of duels, making lots of tackles, and really showing why Bayern Munich were after him and why he was one of the hottest prospects. I know he's a wee bit older now, but like in this you know, the transfer sense, uh, defensive midfielders in, in European football. And this Liverpool midfield has been what's been getting a lot of the headlines. We see Curtis Jones is probably going to come back in alongside Ali Mack and Dom Soboslai. 
But this is, make no mistake about it, a full strength powerhouse of a Liverpool team. They're going away from home while be coming in this game to go on the front foot and, you know, because Liverpool are going to make this really difficult for Fulham. Craven Cottage is a bit of a different venue in the Premier League and, at, you know, Fulham have definitely made it their home and we've seen the best form out of Wobe, Willian, Andy Perea. These guys, when they've been at home. But when you've got Trent Alexander-Arnold back in the building, Curtis Jones has got great energy as well to complement the likes of Sobisly. Full strength defence, obviously, with Kanati and Van Dijk. You just feel this is the platform Liverpool need to make sure that the likes of Diaz, Darwin, Salah can all make sure that they, you know, they're getting shots away, maybe creating chances for one another, but ultimately getting enough goals to secure the three points because when Liverpool are going to go on and commit an attack in this way, with big pal, big pal Palfinia, Lukic, Abebayo, Bassey, these guys, when they can win the ball over, the goalkeeper can win it, Fulham have got real outlets, they've got real threat in behind with Iwobi and Willian coming in to break here. Andy Perea obviously is a very good set piece taker and a very capable playmaker that if he can be found in these kind of little pockets, they've got a target man they can play off of against as well with Muniz. And this will be a game where Alisson's probably going to have to come out and scoop some stuff up now that he's back in town. But make no mistake about it, Fulham are going to get chances, they're going to get opportunities to go and hurt Liverpool in this one. So it's going to be a case for Liverpool of full Jurgen Klopp heavy metal football. Go on from the beginning, try as best as they can to force Fulham back into really uncomfortable positions where they can have their numbers and their quality count to try and make chances and open them up. I think Liverpool having the advantage of coming into this game, knowing that Man City aren't playing and having known the Arsenal score by the time they come into this one, they're probably going to come really well prepared and probably in a quite a good mindset. I think the elimination from the Europa League probably influences them the least compared to the Champions League elimination for Arsenal and in due course Manchester City. I think Liverpool score three goals in this one. I say comfortably in terms of just my mind. I think that they will get three goals in this one. I think they've got the firepower, the motivation and the starting eleven. You know, they've got pretty much all their key weapons at their disposal here. But Fulham are going to get in and get one, I think. I'm going to take Liverpool to win this by three goals to one. I hope you've enjoyed this one, guys. Don't forget to get into the comments section and let me know what your big predictions is for the weekend. On screen and now with some other stuff that I've made that YouTube thinks you might enjoy. Have a great weekend. Stay out of trouble and I'll catch you on the next one.